All right, everybody out there, we're here again. This is the, I guess it's the fifth one of this series that we're doing. And uh, back again, of course, in the pre-show while we get everybody warmed up, tell us where you're coming from, give it a share. And uh, we're going to get into some cosmic stuff tonight. So Zaire, um, why don't you give people a, a little taste of, of your, uh, your exploration as we were preparing for this program? Yeah, for sure. So um, I, our, our guest tonight is, is super dope. And I, I came across her like on Facebook um, in, in another talk that she did. And uh, a lot of her, well, her work about the apocalypse is, you know, very, very fascinating. And she actually like entwines a lot of, you know, to me, pop culture, hip hop culture into it, blackness. And I'm just like, okay, this is, this is like super dope. So she has this zine and I, that was the first time like I, I really read like every word of a zine I did. And it was, it was, it was breathtaking Um, from, you know, Octa Octavia Butler to, you know, these different scholars that are, are talking about the same work. But I went to YouTube and I went down the rabbit hole, okay, with Carl Jung, is it? And um, about like personas, about like the archetypes, um, about like our shadow and shadow work. And I just thought it was really fascinating. So yeah, I, I went down the rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> I did too. Yeah. I was, I started reading. I mean, it's interesting because we'll, we'll talk about all this stuff, but you know, you think about myth and folklore and legend. And that's what, of course, Anderson depicted a lot of, but I really only I intuitively knew, obviously, that there's a reason that myths and legends travel across time and place. But uh, I hadn't really read much of the psychology behind it and understanding this innate urge to reproduce these archetypes and stuff. And yeah, I mean, I, I was I was sourcing all kinds of crazy um, but of course, well-respected, you know, scholars from all across the 20th century and and the way they resonated against Walter Anderson. And then even like Apocalypse, we're going to get to this later in the show. But man, you know, Anderson was actually uh, surprisingly for maybe some who don't who don't know the, the context we're going to bring in was talking explicitly about, you know, nuclear proliferation and annihilation um, and in relation to block prints of folklore and mythology. So it's like, it's, it all interconnects so beautifully. And that's the whole point of what we're going to talk about is like how the mind, uh, is interwoven and how we're connected, even if we don't understand it with people who are far, far away. So it's going to be cool. Oh, for sure. For sure. Have you, have you watched the Umbrella Academy? Only a on little. Netflix? Okay. Yes. So I've watched the entire, you know, season. i like after this research, I'm going to watch it again because it is about the apocalypse and like the end times and how they like, you know, uh, jump through time and things of that sort. So like now that I've done the a little bit of research, you know how you feel like you do a little research now you're an expert. So now that I know a little bit of something, I'm going to go and watch that again. So those of you who are out there, if you have not watched the Umbrella Academy, I implore you to do so because it's a, a a good a good good um show. So after you watch this talk, you will have a little bit more frame of reference to like really enjoy it. There you go. Is that you're getting kickbacks from Netflix? <laughs> Sounds good. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, we're, we're gonna see you on the other side then, and uh, we got some wonderful films, short films from Zaire as well. Um, but that being said, let's get into it. Hit the intro music for Southern Art, Wider World, Myth, and the Psyche. It all starts the southern part of the map The influence the globe ain't nothing harder than that We way smarter in fact in the stories that you heard about us Determination and birth the image we learn to progress It's all a process rebuild and regrow When the value's much more than the silver and gold See the stories passed down through the soil and the dirt And we rose from the ashes so we loyal to the earth And we royal from our birth See the beauty of the landscape Gulf Coast waters crashing on the sandbanks It's like a diamond but hitting in plain sight Gotta let the light shine, cause ceiling it ain't right So I take my time, turn the page, make a line How I feel when I'm in the Mississippi state of mind When the cotton grows high, eh, the town moves slow eh, The river belongs just to get us so home to me
All right, y'all. So we're in the show now. Julian Rankin here with the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. And this um, this program this evening is about myth and the psyche. So we're going to delve into Walter Anderson's depictions of myth, but also his more cosmic view of the world uh, more broadly and more expansively. And we're going to do so with with Lee Sumter, Ph.D., who joins us from Philadelphia. And she's a scholar and multidisciplinary artist who focuses on many things, but um, uses strategies of world building and mythic design. Uh, towards building more resilient communities about survival. And um, it's really um, amazing stuff. I won't go through her whole bio. It's listed on on the event page if you want to learn about her her bona fides and, and where she um, she teaches up more college up in Philly and does many other things, eco activism and and a lot of community based art projects. So um, really fascinating uh, coalescence of myth and nature and the mind, uh, which like Zaire and I were talking about was was pretty mind blowing for us even preparing for the program. So it's going to be fun. We're going to delve into everything, you know, from uh, just the general idea of folklore and myth and legend and believe it or not, go all the way up to, uh, to make a connection between Walter Anderson and Sarah Connor from Terminator two. So that's what you have to look forward to. But as we always do, we want to ground it in the collection. So, you know, what about Anderson's art and what kind of artworks are we going to be speaking about? Um, to do that, we always take a trip into the vault, and here is that journey with our curator, Maddie Codling. We are in front of Don Quixote, Walter's image from 1937. Walter, at this point, he was really sinking into a period of depression, and uh, he was very sad after the death of his father. He actually compared himself to Don Quixote on many different occasions. Uh, kind of this idea of the chivalrous knight who was living in an age of not much chivalry. Uh, he also sometimes thought of himself a little poorly and uh, called himself the fool. And of course, we think of Don Quixote as kind of this uh, silly character in uh, the Western canon of literature. These are archetypal stories that resonate throughout time and countries. So Walter was really thinking about how um, he was perceived by the people. A lot of people on the Gulf Coast, uh, whenever they saw him, would say, oh, there goes that crazy Anderson. His thinking about the world and how it has gotten away from these really ideals of humanity. So we're joined by Lee Sumter. Lee, how are you doing? Good evening. How are you doing, Julian? I'm fine. Thank you. It's good to be what, here with y'all tonight. The the uh, the requisite uh, weather question. What's the weather like in Philadelphia? It's actually it's actually pretty cool. You know, I mean, you know, we were dealing with some mild fall temperatures for a while, but no, it, the temperatures lowered a bit. It's kind of cold over here right now. It's actually interesting. We're not going to talk too much about this uh, explicitly, but, you know, Walter Anderson, he was classically trained in, in academia and went to the Pennsylvania Academy for the Fine Arts. And in his early days, did spent a lot of time at the Philadelphia Zoo painting animals. So, you know, like we were going to say many times throughout this program, everything is connected and uh, even geographically in that sense. But I wanted to start, you know, uh, posing this question overarching question and, and introducing people or reintroducing people to some of the, the block prints and illustrations and things that Anderson did. He was fascinated with myth and legend and folklore. He sought out all kinds of different stories and was just um, really taken with this idea that he was a participant across time. Um, and, you know, when we think about myths and legends, I think one of the things that immediately comes to mind, and right now we're looking at a panel from the community center murals, are like Roman gods and goddesses. And in this case, Anderson is attributing, you know, the god Mars to these stags uh, locked in combat. But what can you say about, you know, myths? If we think only about those stories, we're probably missing a, a larger portion of the picture. So this seems like an easy question, but it may have a complex answer. You know, what are myths and where do they come from? Right. Um, that is, that's a big question, you know, um, and, and almost like to say, like, where do myths come from 
is like an existential question. I think it's almost like saying like, where does consciousness come from? You know, like, why does consciousness exist? And that's a question I know I couldn't answer personally. I don't think too many people can. Um, it's a tough one, you know, and it's one that folks have been trying to find the answers to for millennia um, and, and myths have existed that long, you know. Um, that's the kind of important thing to understand about mythology is that it's timeless. You know, it's reinvented with the ages, with each generation, um, through its symbols and the archetypes, you know. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm not really someone who is really immersed within like the ancient mythologies, even though, you know, I've studied some, you know, um, cross-cultural mythologies in general, but I've really kind of rested um, my interest and my research in the sweet spot that is contemporary mythology like cinema and film, um, you know, speculative fiction, science fiction, uh, even the games that we play, like the video games. I'm not a big gamer, but it is rich with these, you know, contemporary mythologies. And because, you know, my, my focus was also on apocalyptic myth, um, you know, the entertainment industry uh, history in general, you know, the daily news is chock full of the archetypes and, and uh, symbols of the apocalypse, you know, that's kind of what we're living through uh, in this moment. And I should say, too, just to kind of get it, um, you know, across immediately in terms of my perspective and where I'm coming from when it comes to apocalypse is definitely this kind of um, uh, cyclical uh, transformative perspective, one that incorporates birth, death, and rebirth, and these phases of transformation and change that are non-dual. You know, it's not it's not all positive, it's not all negative, um, it's not all light, it's not all shadow. It is all the above. You know. Yeah, and one of the things specifically with if we think about you know keep our our focus on like stories that we tell ourselves and each other. You know, what's the importance of like retelling? Because even in, in contemporary times, obviously everything, not everything, but most things and perhaps everything, um, it comes from something that came before it, especially in, in 21st century, this kind of meta post, post, post modern, wherever era we're living in. Um, post so what would you say about re retelling as a, as a mechanism for um, both sharing and propagating myth, but also adjusting it? Because Anderson, one of the things he did, which I thought was fascinating, was he would interpret and reinterpret myths through his coastal Mississippi lens in this case. But all of us do that as we kind of make our own myths, um, as we kind of tell these, these stories again and again. No, that's a great point. And in fact, that's the part that I'm most interested in, the retelling. Um, you know, this kind of idea of the ancient future and this idea that, um, like you said, there's really nothing new under the sun, but it's about how we reinvent and reimagine um, these old symbols, you know, um, and that's how we give them new life in terms of in terms of the vitality of a symbol. Right. Um, because all mythologies, you know, in order for them to work, they have to have vital symbols in order for them to resonate with a, a critical mass of people um, that believe in them. Uh, you have to have these vibrant symbols. And so, you know, when it comes to symbols, um, we have to adjust and reinvent them, reimagine uh, ones that fit, uh, I guess, the zeitgeist. I mean, that's a term that people use, this idea of the spirit of the age and how important that is um, and how it aligns with contemporary symbols. You know, uh, the zeitgeist is the thing, uh, that vibe, that energy, that um, kind of fuels an age forward in terms of the consciousness, um, the way we see the world, the way we imagine things, you know, our dreams, our hopes, our fears, um, where we pay our attention. You know, we talk about um, visual culture and media culture, and it really is a, any, um, how they call it, like a, an attention economy, right? Um, and that has a lot to do with the symbols in terms of we pay attention to the symbols that gravitate uh, towards us and the ones that we gravitate towards. And I think that in the retelling, that's where these new symbols show up, you know, that we as individuals, whether in our own personal lives, you know, that we have to reinvent um, and find new symbols that work for our own personal mythologies that are different than our fathers and our mothers and their fathers and their mothers, you know, or if it's a cultural mythology where you know, old symbols, like when we talk about some of the monuments, right, that are symbols around the country, like just thinking about America and what it's recently gone through in terms of 
the idea that the symbols that once stood for like the American mythology, right? The mythos of America and where we are right now, um, it very much operates on that level, on the idea of, of light and dark, shadow and, and um, positive, negative, all these things. So I think that what we're finding ourselves in right now is this moment where we really have an agency to create the mythologies of the future. Um, and I think everyone is having a hand in it, you know, um, not just Hollywood and the folks that are writing stories and that we actually witness and see, um, you know, with these published uh, programs, um, where it's literature or film, um, we all are kind of rewriting it for ourselves too. You know, I feel that, I mean, in this pandemic, we're all kind of trying to, we're all at a crossroads trying to figure out what's next for each and every individual, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. And, uh, you know, I want to introduce people to this idea, to go and start to go into the mind um, and and in, in your work in psychology, just to give people, because like, like Zaire and I were talking about, it was, you know, reading some of this scholarship, which we're saving people the um, the work of reading it all by talking about it. But you get, you start to see these ideas of synchronicity across time. And we do quickly get into folks like Carl Jung and and this collective unconscious. And one of the things Anderson was doing, as I mentioned, his fascination with myth, you know, it was things like the Odyssey and and these these ideas of epic and journey and voyage, um, but also like an angry sea. And you think about everything from, you know, again, we're talking about more ancient things, but everything from the idea of the flood, whether it's Gilgamesh or we're talking about Noah's Ark. I mean, these are ideas that um, we know to be archetypal, but I don't think I really uh, consciously thought about what that idea of archetype means. And, and Carl Jung talks about it as this, these kind of pre-existent, non-personally acquired informational fields, uh, which is to say that these are these kind of forces beyond our even awareness uh, that are, are reproducing in, in, in the case of, of media or art, different imagery. So like, how would you introduce the idea that there's artists who, who can be working across time and place and still have this same inspiration um, that is so grounded in archetype? Like what is happening from a psychological perspective? Yeah, it's that collective unconscious thing, that thing, that web of, of the psyche, of the collective psyche of, of the world, of humanity that is connecting us all, you know? And we don't, we don't think about it so much, but you know, when we talk about the matrix, I mean, the matrix kind of was that like modern mythology for the times that let us know, you know, it kind of used a different, uh, metaphor in terms of technology, you know, in terms of that world, but it's the same thing, you know, it's the same thing, this matrix of consciousness that connects all things. And so, you know, that's the great thing about it is that, you know, you might not realize that that's what you're tapping into. So I don't know if Anderson, when he's painting these waves and he's thinking about these symbols, um, if, if he's understanding you know, what he's, I mean, I, I think he was, right? I mean, I think he he already kind of had a natural um, intuitive, uh, I guess, connection to these things, you know, and a lot of people do, um, especially a lot of artists and storytellers and, and myth makers in their own right, you know, they're already kind of tapped into that. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, it, it is about that zeitgeist, like what we were talking about. It's just like a thing, like this force, because you described it, you know, when you were defining uh, the term around archetypes, this idea of the force, you know, um, and the fact that when you think of a force, um, it can also be a force field, you know, when we think and we kind of go into the scientific a little bit and think about energy and fields and thinking about if archetype is a force of energy, right? Like whether it's the shadow archetype or the archetype of, of divinity and, and, um, and light and, um, you know, the positive, uh, these can all have, they, they all have an energy that can be felt um, across, across time, across space, you know? I um, mean, you talked about synchronicity and that was this concept that uh, Jung talked a lot about, one of his, um, you know, kind of signature principles that he developed or really just tapped into, right? Because it's not like he created this, he didn't create synchronicity, he just observed it and, and gave it a name, you know? And I think that so many people, that's one of the terms of Jung's that I think so many people are um, kind of buzzing about now. And they always have been, but I think it's definitely on the tips of tongues of folks, um, like everyday people, you know, just like, you know, the idea of apocalypse is kind of on everybody's tongues right now, you know, because it is a part of our everyday vernacular. 
um, because it's become a part of our everyday world. And I think synchronicities, when you pay attention to them, you see how the material world connects to the psychic world. You know, it's when symbols of the unconscious mind um, pop up in our in our daily lives, you know, and make those connections between the interior world and the exterior world, you know? And that's one of the beauties of synchronicity where it's kind of like when a synchronicity happens, it's kind of like that aha moment that people have. And it's kind of waving a flag to say, excuse me, <clears throat> it's waving a flag to say that, you know, this is this is a moment where something mythic is happening. You know, something um, something on another level is occurring in this moment. You know, and that's why I think it's such a gift to experience that because a lot of people base a lot of life decisions off of synchronicities. You know what I mean? Um, you might meet you know the love of your life that way, or avoid like some serious catastrophe. Um, because you got warned, you know, through a symbol or something, you paid attention to a symbol that came through in a synchronicity. So there's a lot of power in it because it taps into these energy fields, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think the takeaway, you know, one of the takeaways is that it's not when these feelings we have are not necessarily coincidence. It's easy to write them off as coincidence, but the, there's a, a large body of work of people investigating this intangible human mind, which is very much a frontier and a wilderness, um, a la Horn Island for Walter Anderson. I mean, it's undiscovered still um, as we're, you know, kind of marching our, our, along the world today. It's like, how, how do we really um, think about ourselves? I mean, that's that's a whole large question that we're going to continue to tease out before we before we uh, kind of close this segment and, and transition. I want to bring in a few comments for one. Um, you know, we, we got to got to give you the props. We got got a, someone saying they love those earrings. Oh, thank um, you. Thank but also the, also the education. And then Deirdre Payne, who's a, a friend of the museum and of arts and culture in the state, is, has her own definition here of, of myth. And, and it talks about this need for safety and to explain what's happening um, around us. And so that's something that we're going to also delve into um, a bit more. So we're going to pick this up on, on the other side of, of the break here. And as we do, we're going to going to turn it over to the work of Zaire Love to transition us. And here's her first film. Conscious seeks outward manifestation, Carl Jung. Collective unconsciousness can be seen as how we, humanity, earth seed, are connected through our inheritance of simply being a human. It is the universal inheritance of instincts and archetypes. These archetypes are often seen as mother, birth, death, rebirth, power, hero, or child, which you see in many cultures and societies around the world in different forms. Collective unconsciousness transcends culture, race, gender, and many identifiers of our own personal unconsciousness, consciousness, or wholeness, and is rooted in our humanity. Key word, humanity. We're all connected through collective unconsciousness. So now that we brought brought people firmly into um, into the mind, I want to talk more about pattern and aesthetics. And you were mentioning some of this earlier, um, you know, just about symbols that we see, whether those are contemporary or, or more ancient. And one of Walter Anderson's people who who know about his work, he, he employed these seven motifs, um, these these basic. Um, what was called by the art theorist Adolfo Besmo Gard primitive um, symbols that were connecting across time and place. But these actually that we're looking at now were ones he found on a, a piece of pottery near his home. And I just think that, you know, again, that's, that was the purpose of, of the theorist who came up with these motifs and Anderson used them in his work constantly. Um, and but it, it echoes something that, you know, um, Young was again talking about. And this idea that if you're speaking in this language of archetypal symbol, 
that you're you're not just speaking um, on your own behalf, but you're speaking uh, really about the destiny of mankind. So, I mean, I want to talk a bit about your work because you, you even say um, about how this idea of of spiraling this this search for understanding is in endless spiral down 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 in, you know into the psyche and the spiral is one of the motifs um, of course um, so yeah I mean let's talk a bit a bit more about just like pattern and aesthetics and um, and nature too I mean I think the natural world it, it being an animating force is part of all of this where do you uh, start to and how do you connect um, nature, which is in some ways the only thing that's not invented from some other pre-existing condition? You know, we are deriving a lot of what we understand from nature. So how does nature fit into to all this in terms of the pattern that maybe got this whole ball roll and that now we keep repeating this whole cycle? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing about nature, right? Because we as humans, it's always kind of a a toss up to sometimes in terms of the perspective where like, are we humans viewing ourselves as, as humans as a part of nature, like human nature as a part of the bigger natural world and we're a part of that, you know? Or is it, you know, a lot of people sometimes pit humans versus like, you know, against nature, you know? Um, that's a common thing sometimes in mythology, like, you know, man, human versus um, versus the wild or versus nature. And I, I really would like to think in terms of the traditions that I lean towards um, our connection as a part of nature, you know? And that being said, when you think of, um, we talked about the spiral and I guess maybe the, the glorified uh, image of the spiral is the fractal. You know, if you think about fractals, um, you know, I wrote about fractals in my dissertation because I was just so fascinated by how um, there is this connection between psyche and nature and material reality and um, these patterns, right? And this idea that the fractal um, can be found out in nature, can be found in the human body, you know, out in the cosmos, um, and this idea of the self-similarity that um, in terms of aesthetics, right? It's that kind of um, sp like spiral within a spiral um, and a, a symbol within a symbol. And I feel that one, one mythology that's so important right now, we talked about apocalypse, but it's about, you know, the survival of the planet, you know? Um, it's a mythology that is kind of all encompassing because it, it includes um, not just humanity as separate from nature, but the earth, the planet as, and all life on it um, as the mythology of this time, you know, of this age. And I think that those of us who are writing about um, like environmental mythologies or about apocalypse that deals with climate change or issues or even, even cosmic stuff, right? Um, because with me and the kind of speculative fiction that I'm into, there's always an element to the cosmic in terms of, you know, I think um, in Zaire's film, or we were mentioning and talking about Octavia Butler, this idea of uh, the destiny of Earth seed is take root among the stars. And the idea of that um, just the other day, did we not, um, didn't we launch a, a, like a spaceship? <laughs> To, but didn't Elon Musk and the NASA crew and SpaceX just do some stuff, you know, while we were worrying about elections and whatnot, you know, and coronavirus, people were going to space stations and everything, like life's going on. But that's the thing is that, you know, this, this kind of uh, idea of the mythologies of the future um, take nature to another level. You know, I think nature, um, we exclude that, I think, to this planet and Earth because that's all we know. But I feel that like, what is going to be inherently natural for the human race. Um, if all goes well, we will evolve to include an extra dimensional, multi-universal, you know, intergalactic uh, natural experience, you know? And I think that the nature of William Anderson being like such an explorer in his own right, you know, someone who was so interested in the quest myth and quest mythology and the fact that he kind of aligned that with his own life in a lot of ways, all of us do. Like we all want to insert ourselves into our personal mythology. 
um, and it all becomes epic on some level, right? Um, you know, the, your your life, your birth, your death, you know, um, your path towards mortality and experiencing that. Um, everyone has that journey, you know, and I think everyone wants to see their path, their journey as mythic, as epic in some way, shape or form, as, as mattering, you know? Um, and so I think when we talk about matter, we talk about nature and the material world, all these things. And I love that Anderson um, was very much in touch with like, you know, with animals, like the animal world too, you know, um, nature, the sea, uh, you know, the cosmos. It was like, he, he was definitely, um, you know, he, he seemed like this archetypal, it was like a living, breathing symbol, you know, and a living, breathing archetype in his own right. Um, and, and that's a powerful thing to live mythically, you know, um, to be connected to nature, um, connected to the things beyond ourselves. Not everyone has the opportunity to do so, you know? I mean, I think we could all make that choice, but as, as um, Maddie was saying, this idea of um, how people viewed him, you know, as like the crazy man on the mountain or the Don Quixote character, you know? Um, this, this is, um, you know, this is aligning with the fact that sometimes when you're concerned with things outside of the daily life, like the daily rat race, the daily struggle, and you separate yourself from that and you choose to live a mythic life or a spiritual life, you get, um, you get ostracized or you get deemed as other, you know, um, or crazy or out there or whatever. But that's, you know, that's the price you pay. But there's also lots of rewards, you know. And I think yeah. he lived a blessed life. Like he sounds like he enjoyed his life and made the choices he wanted to because he walked his own path. You know, he walked in his own personal myth. And and I, I have high regard for that. Did do you have is it true you have a bumper sticker that says live mythically or something to that effect? I do. I do. I have a couple of those. <laughs> um and I got them. Shout out to Pacifica Graduate Institute, where I got my degree in mythology and psychology. And um you know, I think I got that from my school bookstore or something like that. But that's something that, you know, I learned that this idea of living mythically on a personal level, um, I got to say that that was something that came to me um, when I was kind of first introduced to myth. It was through Joseph Campbell, you know, and he was an educator and a mythologist, um, a writer, pro prolific writer. And um, he taught at Sarah Lawrence College. And um, he did that series Power of Myth with Bill Moyers. And that's how I got introduced to mythology through my dad, you know, showing me PBS, um, watching these shows that were coming on. And um, I just was so intrigued by this idea of myth having power um, and myth being a thing that could help you kind of crack the codes of life, you know, um, as well as past, present and future. You know, it was, it was all these things. Um, and it was a portal to other dimensions, you know, um, it was, a key to certain knowledge and wisdom, you know, mythology is just so many things. And so when you also realize that you are the captain of your own ship, you know, the master of your own destiny kind of thing. Um, and Joseph Campbell was big on following one's bliss. And I feel that like, you know, William Anderson, um, you know, he was just a living example of that, you know, following your bliss, living your own mythic life and making choices that, you know, we don't, we don't all take that path, you know, um, and maybe we do for a time, you know, but it seemed like, you know, Anderson, he was on that path from like, you know, he lived his many years that way. Yeah, no. And, and one of the things about Walter Anderson was, um, you know, as you said, you know, myth making, he was self-aware about his own, own myth. And that goes back to, you know, reading about, um, you know, what, what Carl Jung was doing in the, in the 19 teens and asking himself these questions, you know, basically what, what myth am I living in? Um, and then beyond that, asking himself, you know, what what are the implications of of understanding that um, that, you know, dreams and all of these these things are connected. I mean, it's what Einstein was saying, you know, to understand. So it's, it's a fabulous thing. This is paraphrasing. But to understand that these complex systems um, are, are all in, interconnected. And I think the idea that you can be ostracized for these beliefs because they are way out there. Um, but we're we're floating on a rock in the middle of the the galaxy. I mean, we're all way out there to a certain degree. And, <laughs> and we, don't to... that. we we forget that a lot of times. But let me tell you how during this pandemic, one of the best things I ever did for myself was by myself, like a little amateur uh, professional amateur professional telescope, 
And um, when I tell you to be able to see uh, the moon and certain planets from, from your house, you know, from your apartment, uh, through your window, it really puts the perspective, like it, it reminds you that we are on, what do they say, this third rock from the sun. We were out here in the cosmos. We are not, we are not, I mean, we, feel, we think we're on solid ground, but we were out here floating on this earth ship. And that, um, that perspective, and also just to notice um, the spinning, you know, of things on orbits and axes, you know, um, that's, that's, um, that's pretty wild because I was chasing the moon at one point, trying to, you know, catch it in my telescope. One minute is there, one minute is not. A couple of days later, it's, it's rising from a whole nother part of the horizon, you know, and that's just to show us we are traveling in space, you know, and I think that Folks who really tap into that on the earthly plane, like Anderson, you know, I think he really kind of had an awareness um, of this journey of being an explorer, you know, and um, same thing with like, say, an Octavia Butler and, and anyone who's kind of incorporating the cosmos into their mythology, you know, um, and one is the near future, right? Um, and we just talked about that, that space launch, you know, that's, that's pretty real. Um, that's pretty real thinking about um, how folks are getting up there, you know, and even just like the upcycling of, of space equipment. Like, I guess that's why, you know, I guess the space program is super expensive, but what, um, you know, SpaceX is doing is reusing certain equipment, right. Or certain parts of the shuttle. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an astronaut, but I do know that, you know, when it comes to, um, the budget, this might mean that we're going to get to experience things and see things, um, that humanity, you know, hasn't had a chance to yet, you yeah. know, and, and that, that will shift our, our perspective, um, and, and also alter the zeitgeist and change our perspective on, um, where we're going in the future, like our future trajectory. And that's where the mythologies of the future are coming from. You know, they come from the present, you know, a lot of what we're seeing on screen today in the movies, um, was stuff that folks were imagining based on their projections of, real life happenings, you know, um, headlines and all these kinds of things are finding their way, just like climate change, coronavirus, all this stuff, it's going to find its way into the mythologies of the future. Um, and folks are going to speculate on where we're going to be, what humanity's trajectory is going to be post 2020. You know, there's a lot of that going on right now. And for people who, you know, who think about the, um, or who may not see the connection, although we're making it fairly clearly, but between like today and, thousands and thousands of years ago, this idea of, of the stars. I mean, when Anderson was painting the community center murals here in Ocean Springs, and I mentioned, you know, this one we're looking at is Mars, but he, he named each of these panels after a different celestial body. And there's, there's Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and all the rest. And, you know, it wasn't because he was just um, interested in the, the Roman myths in this case. Um, it was actually because he was like the Arabian traders, he so aligned himself with philosophically looking up at the stars as a map. And when he was going out to the island, you know, and seeing the cosmos spread out before you in a place like that, where the elevation is um, is not getting in the way and all you have is unadulterated sky. I mean, those are the things he was dreaming about. And then you think about the, the, the very idea of a cosmos as this interconnected constellation of stars. I mean, it, it, it pretty quickly maps onto what you were saying about fractals and the way the mind works and the things we're understanding about the electricity that's, you know, the, the, that's jumping across the synapses of our brain. Um, before we kind of do, do another transition where we are going to get deeper into apocalypse, I wanted just to, to give another example of the synchronicity that, that I sort of discovered for myself um, that many people probably uh, could have found um, before me, but this, this, this connection between Young and Anderson. So first of all, this, there's a, there's a publication that Young wrote called the, the red book and it was a, yeah. a compilation. And this was an illuminated manuscript that he, he actually put together. And um, again, from his 19 teens work about dreams and archetype and collective unconscious. And for people who recognize um, and who know Anderson, when you look at this illuminated manuscript, you see these letter forms. And to me, they immediately remind me of Anderson's alphabet block prints. Um, but then you look deeper and you see, again, these, these uh, resonances of the sea beast and the vessel that's carrying folks forth. Um, and Young actually himself, like Anderson, took bicycle trips 
um, near and far. You know, Anderson famously did thousands of miles of bicycle trips across the country and also went abroad to, to China to look for Tibetan temple art. Well, Young went across northern Italy looking for the frescoes and mosaics that would have these archetypal forms. And so as you think about you know, those, those two as just one example of this thing um, that we call synchronicity, you know, the, the kind of quotes that are in the Red Book about Young saying, you know, thinking about this egg, the idea of an egg. Um, oh, I love this. Yeah, the, the, set the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it, and incubate because it. Because you have that photo, you have that, that the image of, yes. That blew my mind when I saw that in your notes, Julian, because I was just like, because, you know, we had said, you know, when we were preparing for this program, you would talk, you were sharing with me about Anderson, because I don't I don't know about Anderson prior to being introduced to his work through you all. And so, you know, I was just like, oh, yeah, OK, so where are, the, where are you seeing the connections? And when I saw the those eggs that he painted and then the quote from Jung, which I had never I don't remember that quote from Jung, right? And I have the Red Book. I'll be honest, the Red Book is actually propping up my computer right now because um, I thought that would bring me some good vibes. Um, but anyway, so this idea of, yes, that's synchronicity right there, you know? Um, for me, when I saw that, I was just like, wow, you know, that's that's really pretty powerful in terms of the symbols. Um, and like you said, the bike ride, like it's just kind of uncanny sometimes how these connections just show up across time you know, many, many years um, across countries, you know, and then it's just like, it's, it's clear as day, you know, it's fascinating. I, I love the connection with the eggs. That's one of my favorites. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a, a fun unearthing. And um, before we transition, I do want to bring in a comment that's going to pose a, a nice uh, fulcrum for us to do this. And this is from Susan, who's talking about her connection um, to the mythic and spiritual in relation to the pandemic, you know, being in a smaller space that with this kind of quieter center, allowing for deeper self-reflection and one of these few gifts as in a time of, of fear and, and tragedy. And I think that that um, that idea of paradox and dark and light is something that you've already brought up. And, and that's something we're going to get deeper into um, when we talk about, you know, apocalypse myth and, and the, the age we're living in, I think everyone always uh, thinks that they're living in the end time. So that is a, a repeating pattern. But oh, because, sure. of mass, because of, yeah, because of mass media, you know, it's it's even more um, relevant for us to think about what that means. So just on cue, um, here comes Zaire with another film to, to bring us into the apocalypse. Welcome to the apocalypse. You have just entered into the apocalypse. Welcome to 2020. It's full of birth, death, rebirth, birth, death, Is this thing recording? Is this thing recording? Sure. I was feeling that, Zaire. I was feeling that, you know. I wanted to, to give to give this comment um, some some uh, exposure here too. Who who who? Wendy's talking about Anderson uh, and and relation to nature and and Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is another thinker, a botanist, and um, you know a, a member of the Potawatomi tribe. And she, her her book Braiding Sweetgrass talks about these indigenous ways of knowing and how we can again merge nature and science and fascinating. Um, scholar in her own right, but but again, Wendy here is observing, um, you know, the role of of myth and nature, and how we can understand the forces at work that are are larger than us, but that we can exist within. So now we're we're firmly in the kind of contemporary moment. I think Zaire's film was a great um, a great way of of recalibrating our brains. Uh, so tell me a bit about this, you know, apocalypse myth. You you alluded to it, but dystopia, you know, apocalypse, the moment we're living in. 
you know, why is it, and, and this gets into your, your, your whole thesis for a lot of the work you do, why is it that we're, we're here and in this moment, you talk about it's not just what we see, but how we see it. Yeah, yeah, the perspective is so important, right? Um, and one thing I had to remember while I was writing uh, my dissertation or even just doing the research, right? Because it was like a seven-year journey for me. I, I mean, that's that's kind of how I remember it. I, I, I come up with that, that number seven. Um, and I feel like, but I've, I've been into apocalypse for a long time. Um, and my introduction to it was through the media. Um, it was through, um, you know, television and, and watching, um, you know, uh, a television movie that, that came on. It was called The Day After. And it was all about nuclear war um, and the Cold War and what would happen, you know, um, if we experienced a nuclear fallout in this country. And, um, it scared, it scared the life out of me. Um, it was the first time I saw like total annihilation um, and, and believed that that possibility was real for me to experience in my lifetime. And so, you know, when we talk about our mythic path and our own personal journey, for whatever reason, and believe me, so many times I tried to tell myself that this was not the case, but for whatever reason, I do believe that my mythic path, my personal mythic journey is aligned somehow with the apocalyptic mythology, right? Now, <laughs> that that seems like it, it's a kind of like fatalistic attitude, like when folks might think about apocalypse. But again, as we saw in Zaire's film, and what I was researching and, and writing about in my dissertation was about this pattern of transformation, this pattern of change of birth, death, and rebirth, right? And so understanding that, you know, even our own lives, like when we think about nature and the cycles of nature um, and how these cycles are about regeneration, you know, and, and beginning and endings and endings and beginnings. And we talked about the Euroborus, the, the symbol of the snake eating its own tail or the dragon eating its own tail. There's a lot of iterations and variations of that symbol, but it's almost as old as time, you know, and, and human consciousness itself in terms of that symbol and, and how it's been uh, tracked across cultures. We talked about how these symbols and these archetypes show up worldwide, you know, over time. And I think that, you know, right now it's hard to deny, right? One of the things I also talked about was these themes because I studied apocalypse through the cinematic narrative. You know, I wasn't necessarily looking at um, the headlines exclusively, like what we see in our daily lives, but I was also looking at narratives and visual culture and myth in the movies. And when we look at this, um, a few of the themes that came up was revolution and rebellion, war and terror, devolution and disease, evolution and transcendence, um, alchemy, the quantum quest, the idea of the journey, right? The hero's journey or the hero's, heroine's journey and kind of taking that in a modern day perspective um, and we think about the advances of science and technology and all the things that we're, just the fact that we're doing this now, right? This is kind of a, a quantum reality in the sense that we're virtual, you know, we're in different dimensions of space and reality that we operate and exist and engage in life these days. And so um, when you think about all those themes that I just talked about, um, we can see that in every aspect of life that we're experiencing right now, right? When we talk about revolution and rebellion, what has been happening in this country, around the world, you know, um, for, for decades, but we're, we're kind of experiencing a, a, a tipping point, if you will, you know, there's also a tipping point, um, that concept carries over to the climate, right, and this idea that we are reaching a tipping point um, with the ecological crisis that we're in. Um, we reached, obviously, a tipping point um, with the nation in terms of democracy and where we stand with that, you know, I mean, we're, we're dealing with um, a crossroads for this country that um, is setting precedents left and right. Um, and, you know, so when we think about all these things and then also evolution and transcendence, we just, again, talking about the space shuttle and like the fact that humanity is still reaching for the stars. We're still reaching to, um, you know, seek and explore and quest, you know. Um, that's that's what that space shuttle represents symbolically, archetypally. You know, that's what that's really all about. And so when you kind of include all these things, they all fun, fall under this umbrella, this archetypal field, right? They fall with it kind of to use the analogy of the field, you know, and the archetypal field of apocalypse, all those themes. 
belong to that field, you know? Um, all the headlines that we're reading today, um, when we talk about, you know, from the speech, pick a candidate, doesn't matter. You know, they tapped into these this archetypal field of apocalypse, you know? Um, whether it's like for the, you know, fighting for the soul of the nation, you know, what Carl Jung talked about was this idea of soul and psyche, how they are um, connected or even one and the same, you know, for him and, and his ideas, soul and psyche were, um, you know, connected, you know, they were pretty much uh, the same, you know, kind of synonymous. And so when we think of uh, the collective unconscious too, and kind of going back to some of these symbols in Anderson's work, like the sea is a symbol for the unconscious, you know? Um, we, and so is space, you know? And to kind of bring the idea and, and these images and, and symbols of uh, this mythology of consciousness too, you know? Um, space, the sea, um, all these things represent um, this vast field, this depth um, of darkness, you know, that is kind of untapped unknown to, to all of us, right? And I think that in order for humanity um, to grow, to transform, um, it seems like so many of these mythologies are trying to tap into these areas that we just still don't know, you know? Um, and I think that's why there's such an enamoration with, uh, there's always gonna be an enamoration with explorers when it comes to contemporary mythologies. It's almost like one of the most important archetypes of the future is always gonna be like the scientist, the explorer. I mean, we've got the hero and the heroine and the villain, but when it comes to pushing the envelopes of our existence and what it means to be human, the scientist is important. Right, and um, obviously important to 21st century reality. Um, you know, the, I, the question of science when it comes to this coronavirus and everything, like everyone's like, you know, how, like how important is science when it comes to this? But then also too, um, you know, spirituality and the evolution of, of the human form even. You know, the fact that the flesh is weak and we thought, talk about technology and cyborgs, you talked about Terminator, you know what I mean? The reason why the Terminator was such a frightening uh, antagonist, a frightening villain of the future, is because that thing was indestructible. And against the human flesh, like you can't, you don't stand a chance. You know what I mean? Um, and so that means that as we as humans, are we going to evolve and become part human, part machine in order to adapt to, um, you know, hot, like hostile environments? You know, the fact that climate change is not making this, this planet um, easy to live on. You know, yeah. You can say humans, humans, we as humans are not, not making this planet easy to live on. But you know, um, we're the ones suffering, and so is all, all the sentient beings and and uh, wildlife and and nature. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, this idea of of explorers and scientists. I mean, this this is to meld those together in a way and and bring it back to Anderson it, it, and Terminator. Uh, it's this idea of, of like the, the who is bearing the message, the messenger, the carrier. I mean, one of the things that we haven't talked about explicitly yet, but I want to mention is you know Anderson had his own bouts with mental illness, and from the period of like nineteen thirty seven to forty, he spent time in mental institutions um, at different places all over the country. And these, this is an image from when he was in, in there and, and he was painting and, and excuse me, drawing and, and pencil. So this, this man in palmettos is, is twofold. It's, it's nature and him hopefully, uh, you, know, you know, being hopeful that he would escape and get back. And then also, if you look at the way these, these shapes are almost explosions around him, it's this idea of, of the cacophony that, you know, of being trapped. And, and, and that was something that he, uh, took into his own hands and literally escaped multiple times from institutions. Once in Maryland, walked home to Ocean Springs, Mississippi, here on the Gulf Coast. And he had in his mind, and I think we can agree, you know, an insight into this idea of, of collective unconscious and archetype and myth, but also just how nature could could be a, another messenger for us. And you, But you think it takes a certain mythic person to escape from, to even attempt and escape. And it is not unlike Sarah Connor um, getting, so this is the payoff for my tease earlier, not unlike Sarah Connor escaping the mental institution and, you know, being ridiculed and, and even trapped in there because she had these beliefs that the end times were coming. And, and then there you go. So, I mean, in some ways, I'll just say it here. Anderson is the, the Sarah Connor of his time, right? He's trying to give people, give people a heads up that here comes 
um, here comes something that uh, is deadly coming down the pike. And how can we, you know, how can we avoid that? Um, I want to turn it back to you before, because I, I do want to, um, I, I want to talk a bit more about this birth rebirth idea and to, to mention, I'm going to show this little, little clip here as we go inside Anderson's little room, because you talked about nature and this cycle of birth and rebirth. And the little room here is Anderson's, you know, it was his private space that's here at the museum and it's uh, an endless day. It's called creation at sunrise. And it's so the rooster calls in the day in the, in the, in the Eastern wall and it goes all the way through one cycle of a day. And this was his most private work ever, that he ever made. It was just for himself. And it's sort of captured in, in um, a, a concise, uh, almost like Amber, you know, um, time, it stopped time, but it also perpetuated time. And so this idea of, of nature being, regenerative um, and some of these works by Anderson like this these embryos these laughing embryos that I, I really didn't know what to make of um, these pelicans being birthed I mean it, 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 these take on different weights when you really blow out this idea of of nature apocalypse and 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 myth um, beyond the pages of a book and into the stratosphere yeah yeah I mean it's it's fascinating um I don't know. I'm I'm just blown away by his his insight. You know, um, just the story about him escaping the facility where he was. I, you know, I love that story because, you know, um, I, Sarah Connor is one of my favorite protagonists of all time. Um, next to Ripley, you know, from Aliens, as far as apocalyptic stories. In fact, my focus in my dissertation was uh, female protagonists from uh, apocalyptic films. Um, Jung talked about the anima um, as a feminine archetype, um, you know, anima and animus, but the, the anima was for me, um, this figure that was aligned with apocalypse, right? And, and with psyche itself and the imagination. And so, you know, this idea of the apocalypse complex, right? And how, um, there's another film too, uh, 12 Monkeys. If you've ever seen that, it was shot in Philly. It stars Bruce Willis, Madeline Stowe, and uh, Brad Pitt and some others, right? Now, the thing about this story is that she was a psychologist um, and she was studying, um, I think it was called the Doomsday Syndrome or something like that. And uh, that was what she was writing about. And in my dissertation, I write about the apocalypse complex. And I only figured out these connections after the fact. I, I didn't like, I wasn't really paying attention to the title of the psychologist's uh, work in this fictional story. I was just paying attention to the story um, and the action of it, right? But then when I became a scholar of apocalypse and then look back at it, you know, you see these connections, just like I believe, truly believe that Walter Anderson, he wasn't um, necessarily aware of some of the connections he might have had to Jung in his life, you know what I mean? But maybe if he had studied in retrospect, if he was around to kind of look and examine, he might have been surprised by some of the synchronicities between their lives and, and their work and the images that they, you know, they resonated with um, and gravitated towards. And I think that for me, you know, I do think that, um, you know, I've, I've been kind of played with that. I mean, now it's it's a little different because you know, we're living through multiple pandemics, you know, um, and, the, and like I said, the idea of, of apocalypse is not uncommon in terms of the vernacular and the zeitgeist that's on folks' minds and, and their hearts and their and their lips, right? And every everywhere we look, we see these images. But I feel that like there was a time when I was studying this maybe 10 years ago where I would, I would get, I would get side eyes and crazy looks about you know, why, why am I so kind of fixated on this subject matter, you know? But believe me, I'm, I'm not the first. There's so many people who've been studying this um, in terms of apocalyptic mythologies. I think everybody takes their own approach. But I do think that, we, like you said, like Anderson had his own approach to kind of raising awareness to this existential concern that he felt so deeply within his heart, you know what I mean? That he had to live this life um, he talked about portals and, you know, how to travel to alternate dimensions, even within this earthly plane, you know, um, because he felt whether it was an escape or a survival uh, mechanism, you know, uh, for his way to kind of protect himself, you know, because like you said, it's like, you know, you could end up like Sarah Connor, you know what I mean? Locked up in a straitjacket, you know, when actually what you're talking about is the truth. 
a truth that's very inconvenient for the rest of the population to admit, you know? Um, and that was that was Sarah's problem, right? I mean, what she was thinking was true, but no, nobody wanted to hear it, you know? I love it. I love nobody it. Nobody wanted to talk about, like, the end of the world, like, for real, for real, you know? Yeah, I mean, and, uh, you know, Anderson's whole thing about leaving the mainland and going to the island, he, he really wanted to experience nature. It was very experiential. It was not theoretical. Um, and and Young, of course, if, if you were to read about his experiments, it was about trying to, to, for him, put himself in this unconscious dream state to try to get in tune with what was happening in the, in the brain. Anderson was physically doing that, um, putting himself in this other space, literally a different reality. He, he called the dominant mode on shore what, what was happening on the mainland and what was happening on the island was something um, transcendent. But I, I just wanted to, to, to put out there, if, for anyone out there who's thinking, you know, Walter Anderson has nothing to do with uh, with annihilation of humanity. The the kicker to all of this is where we started on his block prints. So, you know, the, the, the beautiful block prints of myth and legend, uh, the magic carpet here, um, those were in, in 1949 included in an exhibit, an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum in New York. And in the press release, the archival press release, if you were to read it, you would find a quote from Anderson that says uh, in part that what he was doing here um, in, in his block prints was actually trying to, in some ways, avoid uh, nuclear annihilation. He says the alternative to the atomic bomb explosion, the annihilation of humanity, would be obtained through art in a series of small explosions. And he goes on to talk about how these uh, these myths and folklore um, block prints were an art in general was was a way to create uh, rather than destroy life. So, you know, I just want to leave people with that to say that Walter Anderson uh, was in, in many ways participating in, in myth and legend and, and uh, intercontinental and uh, galactic uh, conversations just by way of, of synchronicity. He was also explicitly thinking about how art, um, even in his time, was a way to uh, perhaps avoid you know, the, the annihilation that all of us sometimes feel in, in the modern world. So that being said, I'm going to bring Zaire back in. Um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing if she has anything to, to leave us with. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, and you're watching live, put them in there now or forever hold your peace. We'll try to get to them here as we give final thoughts. But Zaire, what, what's on your on your mind after uh, listening to our conversation? No, I was just soaking it in. I I, I want a fangirl right now, but I, I won't do it too much. Um, but I do have a question. Um, so we, you know, we've been talking about, you know, death, birth, re rebirth, and like myth making and retelling, and a lot of uh I know a lot of scholars now, especially um, yeah, I think a lot of scholars now we are like retelling these stories. So I wanted to see, like I like I told you before, uh I was I was knee deep into the zine that you uh, sent over, um, and you know, I was I was fascinated about it so much. And I wanted to know, like, what stories and 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 what myths are you making? What stories are you retelling, or that you want to retell? You know, in the work that you do. Oh, I love that question. Thank you, Zay. I appreciate that because. Um, yeah, look, I'm I'm just getting started, but I feel like I have spent a lot of time consuming mythologies, movies, all shapes and forms and, and platforms. Um, I've been getting as much as I can, and now I'm ready to create my own. And so I've been working on a project called Graffiti in the Grass. It's a speculative fiction, apocalyptic, Afro-apocalyptic story set in future Philadelphia, like circa 2045, like the near future. And for me, um, you know, it involves a bit of time travel and exploring multiple, multiple dimensions of time and space. But it's also like, I'm, I'm into the quest myth too, right? Like in terms of like, um, when, like if I had a brand of story that I could create, you know, there's kind of genres and multiple genres that can kind of get blended together. But it's this idea of the quest and, and the apocalyptic, but also the race against time, right? Because there's certain um, apocalyptic stories that are kind of slow burning, but then there's others that is just like, the whole movie is like the clock is ticking, you know what I mean? And these are the ones that are most fascinating to me um, because that's how I felt all my life. Like Sarah Connor, that ter Terminator is one of those stories. She was always up against that clock in terms of when the apocalypse was gonna happen, 
She had to save the world, save her son, protect her son. Um, the Fifth Element, uh, again, another one with Bruce Willis. He tends to find his way into apocalyptic stories. Um, but that one was all about the end of the world. Um, Strange Days. Um, Catherine Bigelow was the director, and uh, um, Angela Bassett was in that one, one of my favorites. Um, but that was like a New Year's Eve, like 1999 to 2000. It was all about the dropping of the ball and everything. Um, but there's so many stories. And so for me, that's what my story is about. It's about the eve of a cosmic event that is basically going to um, create a serious problem for this planet and, and all who live on it. And, you know, it's about uh, a Black and Indigenous protagonist, um, Roxy Redmoon, who is, you know, she's trying to find her missing sister, but she's also trying to, you know, save the world. So um, I love stories that take place in the near future. Again, like Octavia Butler, I'm a big fan of her work. And one of the reasons why I loved uh, Parable of the Sower so much was because it, it took place in the near future that is actually unfolding right now. You know, mm -hmm. she started her story in the 20s, you know, the 2020s. And so here we are now. Um, and there's a lot of what she wrote about that we are, you know, kind of seeing unfolding right before our eyes. And I think that there's lessons in that because one of the things that, um, you know, we talked about, well, why, why does mythology exist? You know, it's more about like, you know, how is it used in our lives? And one of the reasons it is, is because it teaches things, you know, mythology is a tool for education. And I think that for me, when it comes to apocalypse mythologies, it's teaching us the pedagogy of apocalypse is like how to survive, not only how to survive, but how to be reborn, right? How, how do you rebirth not only yourself, but humanity, you know what I mean? Um, reality, you know, like the idea of the matrix, like, yo, like that was mind blowing. And you know, that came out in 1999. I think that's when the first of the trilogies was released. And so we were on this cusp of the new millennium, you know, and everyone was walking around who wasn't talking about the matrix that, you know, just like people used to talk about the force and star Wars, you know, um, and that became, a crossover into our daily reality, the force, like, you know, may the force be with you. I mean, I don't know if the Star Wars thing resonates with y'all, but I don't know. I'm actually I'm actually sitting on my, my Star Wars pillow. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do, I do enjoy a little bit of Star Wars wherever I can get it. Um, but that's because it resonated with me in such a way. And if you don't know a little bit of history, that George Lucas worked very closely with Joseph Campbell. Um, to develop the mythology of Star Wars, you know, because uh, George Lucas knew that Campbell was on point with that. And that any story that's going to last through the ages, as Star Wars has, clearly, I mean, I also got me a Baby Yoda t-shirt, you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's like that, that, that program is still talking to me because of the archetypes of the mythology that is so rich, so profound, um, and so real for so many people on certain levels. And I think that that's my goal. I want to try to create a mythology that is going to resonate in a timeless way, but also educate, you know, and inspire and get folks to focus on the light, you know, to have hope. Um, because believe me, and I do want to, you know, for the, set the record straight that I'm not about gloom and doom. You know, I'm not about apocalypse as this vehicle of doom and destruction only. It's definitely about um, world building. It's about, you know, kind of rising from the ashes. You know, uh, Octavia Butler is big on that as well. And this idea of, um, that was in Earthseed, right? In the, in the spiritual text that Lauren Oya um, Olamina, who's the protagonist of that story, what she did was create a spiritual text from a fictional speculative story that has resonated on such a real level with people today to where, you know, those verses can get you through your daily life in the world today, like reality 2020, you know, these are things that I'm, I've, I've taught that. Um, I teach Afrofuturism um, at Moore College of Art and Design. And you talk about Anderson, one of the things we have in common, mm -hmm. uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts here in Philly, I'm actually teaching a class on the art of surviving apocalypse um, with for pre-college students. These The youth are really, they're, they're gonna save the day for sure, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just teaching about Octavia Butler, we're reading Parable of the Sower again as well in that class. And I feel like there's there's so much to be learned. I mean, the idea of just having parable in, in the title of the book implies that there's lots to be learned from fiction, from Afrofuturism, from all stories of the future. You know, we all have a place in world building and creating mythologies that we can live in. And like, and this last thing I'm going to say is that 
you know, one of the things I think Anderson was really doing in terms of trying to live mythically and why it worked for him was because of the immersion, you know, like the immersion into the mythic world, um, whether it's nature, technology, whatever it is, the immersion is key to living mythically, you know? You can't live mythically unless you immerse yourself within that world, you know? And so like, for example, the Egyptians, like their mythology was not stories that they read or movies they watched, you know what I mean? Or, you know what I mean? That they lived mythically because their myths were their reality. It was because the immersion, I mean, the temples that they erected, the, you know, the tombs, um, the, did anyone see the doc? You're talking about documentary. You're talking about uh, Umbrella Academy. But please mm -hmm. watch that, that documentary on Netflix about Saqqara, the, the tombs of Saqqara. Um, you know, they found that unearthed tomb that had everything intact, you know, and it is mind blowing. I mean, 4,000 years, y'all. And this is still here because that civilization was immersed within their own mythologies about the afterlife. You know what I mean? They took that to the next level. They were very serious about it. And, and their afterlife, like they did everything in their current life and their present life to work towards that because they believed wholeheartedly in that myth, you know, in that mythology. And I think that, you know, that's kind of what we need to do right now. I think the job of storytellers and myth makers, you know, movie makers today, um, artists, you know, like Anderson, is to create these images, you know, these stories, these mythologies that take us into the future in a way that we can believe in, you know? Um, so it can't be all death and destruction because who, who wants to believe in that? That's not gonna get us very far, you know? If the myths are the path to which we experience a new reality, right? A new world. Then we have to. Um, we, we've got to create ones that are viable, you know, that are vital, um, that are like, you know, kind of that analogy of the flood. This idea of, you know, we've we've got to create a ship that's going to hold humanity and take us, you know, through the flood to the next thing, to to, to higher ground, you know, or to outer space, one or the other. Take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, um, I mean, I think that that's a, a place to leave it, you know, and, and just to, on the museum's behalf, what we're doing specifically in this program, but part of our project in this idea, in this vein, is to revisit and reinterpret Anderson and to spin his ideas forward into the contemporary moment. Um, so, you know, he's obviously in, in his own life valuing myth and legend. Um, but more specifically, like you're saying, he was living mythically and immersing himself in nature and staying out on Horn Island when Hurricane Betsy hits in 1965 and lashing himself to a tree on higher ground and, you know, and fleeing and escaping and finding his own providence and reality. So, you know, I would just encourage everybody. We always try to leave it here with a little bit of, of Andersonian advice, but, you know, to 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 live mythically, to, to borrow your phrase um, and also to to be that. Uh, frontier seeker and and to find you know some way of expressing you know your own version of this of the synchronicity that we're all a part of and to look, you know look beyond your present circumstance um, change your perspective um, and and that'll take us take us somewhere and we don't know where we're going but but like we're saying we're on a starship we're we're here we're we're going somewhere. <laughs> We're definitely going somewhere. So, know? Lee, where where can uh, throw us a, a website where people would do want to follow more and learn more about your work? Where can they find out about it? Yeah, you know, um, I'm just grateful that Zayn found me on on the interwebs and everything because mm -hmm. I, I could be more active, but I guess we all are trying to do that these days. Um, but you can find me at leesumter.com. I have a website. You can find out more about my projects there, or you can follow me on IG at Myth media studios that's myth as in mythology myth media studios on ig awesome well thank y'all both uh, y'all have a wonderful and, and mythic evening and have some some really exciting um, and mind-blowing dreams why don't you yes thank you so much to the two of you thank you again all right y'all we're, we're gonna gonna get out of here with the outro music thank you all for tuning in and uh, we'll be back again just a few weeks with another installment in the meantime uh, do something creative and and uh, stay safe. Stay safe.